Okay, so um, we are going to, you know, talk about uh, new um, new work, <coughs> new material, and uh, this is in connection with. Uh, okay, just one second. Uh, let me do this again. So you can edit this, um, um, Enrica. Okay, so we are going to talk about um, um, new material uh, which relates to what is called fundamental metrics. And this is in relationship with the transformation between two images. And we have been talking about um, for some time. And uh, as you just heard, that we can relate two images by a translation. You know, translation X, translation Y. Or we can have rotation, or we can have rigid transformation which include a translation in the rotation or we can have similarity transformation, which is a scaling in the rotation, and a fine which captures lots of these things uh, at, the, uh, at the top, and which has the six parameters. So we have the affine transformation of the rotation, and scaling and that matrix, which has four parameters, then you have translation, you have six parameters. And then more general case is a projective transformation. Uh, which has eight parameters and affine is a special case of projective. And we also looked at the, uh, the linearization of projective, uh, which has approximation of projective transformation, like pseudo perspective and bilinear and so on. Okay? So today uh, we are going to talk about um, a new um, transformation between two images, which is called the fundamental matrix. And let me first make sure the audio is working and um, also I'm online. Okay, good. So this fundamental matrix is very important um, concepts and it will be used in lots of different places uh, and uh, but it is very intuitive, very simple so you need to pay attention uh, and I will make it interesting uh, for you guys. So fundamental matrix, again, is like a transformation between two images. And once we can find the fundamental matrix, then it has lots of application, including uh, the, that we can do stereo. When you have two images, we can do the depth recovery you know, from two images using stereo. And we, fundamental matrix is also used in structure for motion that you can recover 3D information from a sequence of images, and it can be used also in human action recognition, and there are many, many applications of fundamental matrix. It's a very important concept. So, um, for example, the stereo, you have these two images, one is the left image, right image, uh, we can come up with a depth, each pixel, that how far that pixel is from the camera. And this is another example, and this is the recovery of this, and then in visualization of that image from different viewpoint. Um, so important step in uh, stereo is to be able to rectify images uh, so that we can find the uh, given a point in the left image, we can find its match in the right image along the same row. And that is will simplify a lot. Um, and that can only be done if we can if we can take any arbitrary images taken from different viewpoint and, and align them so that they are rectified now. And due to rectification, then this row will correspond to this row and so on. The matching will become simple. And it's a very important step in the stereo. So for that, we can use fundamental matrix to help us to do it. And um, also, as you remember, uh, I showed you this video, uh, Microsoft uh, Photosynth. Uh, where they have a method which will recover 3D information. Um, and you have seen this. So I'm going to skip a uh, little bit. Um, and you can, you know, you have a link. So you can, you can watch this. This video is available. So they will take different pictures uh, off of some building, some area, and then they will reconstruct 3D and basic uh, operation there is to be able to com compute the fundamental matrix. Um, and if you read their method in detail, you will find out 
that that is important that they need to compute that okay so fundamental metrics um, started um, from a paper from a British uh, scientist uh, called Longent Higgins, 1981 and he actually talked about what is called essential metrics uh, which we are going to talk in, which we are going to talk about and which is the metrics relating the two 3d coordinates of left image and right image or left camera right camera and then in 1992 um, Richard Hartley and Olivia Fogras the, the this one is an Australian uh, researcher actually he was working in US in GE and this is the French um, uh, researcher they published this paper simultaneously in two different conferences about this fundamental matrix and both are given a credit about that then there's a lot of work about fundamental matrix and uh, one of known work is Zheng Yu Zheng who is now at Microsoft was a student of uh, Fogras uh, have done robust estimation of the fundamental matrix so the interesting thing is that um, fundamental matrix is so um, crucial so important in computer vision there's actually I found this uh, YouTube video there's a song about fundamental metrics so just to make you makes you um, interested in this uh, math stuff so how do we play this thing um, so I thought to show you that control and then this Hmm. Okay, now it's opening. Oh, great. Okay, how do I go to the thing? To do the whole thing? Um, So is there an audio here? Maybe we can... Richard Hartley is from Australia, so this is the, the famous opera in Sydney.
Okay, so you like it? <laughs> okay, so that's, you know, that's the science is um, good. Um, so let's go to, um, back to the lecture. And, um, and all these things they were talking about um, in this, uh, actually we will talk about all the epipoles and epipolar line and all these uh, in the song. Okay, so um, so I'm going to you know cover um, little um, preliminaries which will be used in deriving this um, uh, fundamental matrix um, very quickly so that you feel comfortable. So one idea is of called linear independence, and most of you I think must be familiar with that. But just for the sake of completeness, I want to cover those. So then other is rank of a matrix and matrix norm and singular value decomposition and vector cross product um, and vector, vector cross product matrix multiplication and RANSEC. Actually there's a song about RANSEC, uh, RANSEC also, I'll, I'll play that for you also. So, so the, as you know that if we have a set of vectors, these vectors say V1 to Vn, they are linearly independent if we can write down like this where we have the coefficients A1 to An and not all of them are zero, which means they, these, all these vectors are linearly independent, so we cannot write one vector in terms of other vectors. And that's a definition of that, and that's a basic idea, and linear algebra is used a lot. So that's one thing which you need to know. Second thing is the rank of a matrix. So this rank can be a column rank or the row rank, and it is basically, if I have a matrix, how many, if I want to look at the column rank, how many columns are linearly independent? That will become rank. If there are five columns, then five is a rank. And then we have a row rank, which is also how many rows are linearly independent. If all of them are linearly independent, then it will be the full rank of that matrix. Um, so, uh, and the rank in a way gives you a, a dimension of the space. Uh, and the column rank will be the dimension of the column space and then row rank will be the dimension of the <coughs> row space. So here's examples, there's a 3 by 3 matrix, the maximum rank it can have is 3, number of rows or number of columns. But um, this, this matrix has a rank 2. And what you do is one way to find a rank is you convert this in the row echelon form. You must have done this the Gaussian elimination backward substitution, how you solve a linear system. So you take this matrix and uh, try to make this uh, uh, upper triangular matrix. You make all zeros here, blow the triangle, and so that uh, it becomes the row echelon form. So we are going to do the operation. We take the first row, multiply by two, add to the second row. So then these, these will cancel with this, and then we'll get like that. Then we'll have another operation, we are going to take the third row and minus it and then add to the first row. And then this will give you, this will become zero. So then the final operation will be, we'll take the second row and third row, we'll add up, so this will become zero. So now we have this kind of upper triangular matrix. And uh, since the last row is zeros, then the rank of this is two, okay? Because zero is not, a, you know, one of the vector linear independent. So there are different ways to find the rank of matrix. So you need to understand the maximum rank is maximum number of columns or rows, but most of the time the rank is lower than that. That's one concept. So the second concept is called singular value decomposition. So I can take a matrix, say uh, A, and it doesn't have to be square matrix, it can be M by N rectangular matrix. I can break it into three matrices. O1 and the gamma and O2. There are three matrices. This is also called factorization of matrix. I'm factorizing this matrix in three matrices. When I multiply all these three, then I get this matrix. Okay? So now this is M by N, and this is M by N, and this is N by N, and this is N by N. So that is called singular value decomposition, and uh, MATLAB has a function that will give you. SVD, a singular value decomposition of a matrix, and it's also very useful. Okay, so this is always a diagonal matrix which will have the singular values or the square root of the eigenvalues, 
and these are the orthogonal matrices which means you can take a, a column and multiply with itself be one if I, if I take a column multiply with other column will be zero that's called orthogonal matrices so the next concept is a norm of a matrix you know like you are used to a norm say l1 norm of a scalar which means absolute value is a norm or you can take the square the Euclidean norm you can take a square and under root that's the Euclidean norm so similarly there's a norm for a matrix matrix has many numbers it has rows and each row has some different elements so one is the l1 norm which is shown here what we do we go to the each row of a matrix take the absolute value add them up we get one sum we take the next row take the all the absolute values of the that row sum them up we get another number we have these numbers and we pick the maximum one and that's a, the norm of a matrix and so l1 norm because we are finding the absolute value similarly there is the infinity norm uh, which is the um, uh, which is shown here that we look at the uh, absolute values of these um, um, elements in the in the matrix and pick up the maximum one whichever the maximum one is uh, some of that and we pick the maximum one so uh, these are different norms now the next thing is the that how we can express the vector cross product in the matrix multiplication so as you know if I have two vectors a and b then I can find out the cross product of those two vectors by using that i j k and a x a y a z this is the first vector this is the second vector and the way it works we will find actually determinant of that so we will first element will be remove this one this one come a y b z minus the um, <coughs> a z minus b y which will be this element first element the next one will be this one and this one then we'll multiply these two axbz minus azbx and with a minus sign because plus minus plus which is shown here then the third one is we remove this one and this one then axby minus aybx which is shown here so that is the cross product of two vectors which you have learned okay so now what we want to do that we can show that we can represent a cross product as a matrix multiplication with a vector so we will make a matrix from vector a which is this one like that and this matrix is anti-symmetric which means on the diagonal we have all zeros and then these element if this element is uh, a z then this will become minus a z if this is um, <clears throat> a y this will become minus a y so these are negative of each other and the diagonal element of zero this is called anti-symmetric matrix so we take a vector a which has three components we made a three by three matrix like that now we can take a vector b multiply with this we will get like this and this is exactly same as here and so which means is saying you that um, the cross product can be expressed as a matrix multiplication where matrix is formed from the first vector as an anti-symmetric matrix and then you can verify if I multiply this with that I'll get first element multiply this with second I'll get this one and so on so that is another concept which we are going to use okay so the next thing is called random sampling and consensus and this is called RANSEC and I have a song for this also and this is also a very important concept which is used a lot that's why you know, people have written songs about it so so let's listen to the song first see how hard I'm trying you do motivate <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, you got an idea. So I'll give you a link so you can you can watch it in you know, the full thing. Okay. So so again the the idea is very simple and intuitive. So one thing you will um, notice in science that the things which really become popular and the things, the methods, the concept which becomes very useful, crucial, at the end they are very simple, very intuitive. That's the beauty of the science that at the end you can explain things very easily. And the concepts which are very complicated, at the end they will not become popular because the nature is very simple at the end. You can describe everything with simple terms. And so Rensek is another very simple intuitive idea um, which um, is used, for example, if you have a set of points which is shown here. So we have five points, we want to fit a line to that. Okay. So this is the equation of line, y is equal to mx plus c. And typically what you will do, you will do the least square fit, as we have been talking about that. And but you you can do using what is called RENSEC. So RENSEC is stand for random sampling and consensus. Okay. So we are going to do the um, sampling of the um, points. We are not going to use all the points available to fit a line, but we are going to use the minimum number of points required to find fit a equation of line. And the equation of line minimum number of points is two because we have slope and intercept. Okay, so so there's another method which we'll actually talk about that also half transform, but, but let's focus on this. So this is your typical uh, least square fit, uh, that this is the equation of line, and then we minimize this, uh, the square of the error, we come up with the, these parameter m and c, so that this is a least, that's why it's called least square fit. Okay, so now, <coughs> The, what we do, as we've been talking about, we get the one equation for one point. So we have, say, n points. We get n equations, and we can write down like this, uh, matrix and vector form, and we have two unknowns, which is m and c, and this matrix is not a square, so we can multiply by transpose and get a pseudo inverse, and this is the way we find. It's been pretty simple. We have done many, many times. It's called least square fit. So, um, now the RENSEC um, is the method which looks at differently. And it's so a random sampling and consensus. So the idea is that we will select randomly two points from the end points, you know. And we will find fit a line. And we will find the error of that line from the rest of the points. And we will note that. Then we again randomly sample another two points, fit a line and find the error from the rest of the points and note down that. So we keep doing that, whichever will give you a minimum error, that's a solution. So this approach is very good in presence of when they have a noise. When you have, in this case, when you have these points, um, say some of the points you are trying to fit here, there's a point here, so for example, it's an outlier, which was just a noise. But now this will spoil the whole line because it will try to fit that point also and that will be a problem. But Rensek what's going to do since it requires only two points so it's going to select say randomly two points, point number three and point number five, fit a line and find the error. Of course the error from this other point will be large but the error from the rest of the point will be small. Randomly select another two points, say one and four then fit a line, find the error. And keep doing that at the end, it will find the line which fits most of these people, most of these points, and it will get rid of the random noise, the noisy points, the outlier, and that's the idea of the RENSEC. Okay, it's a basic concept, and you can use for anything, and we're going to talk about that, how we'll use this in the computing fundamental metrics. Okay, so that's that. So now um, we, I think, are done with the you know, preliminaries, you know, the RENSEC, uh, the norm of a matrix, SVD, the rank, linear independence, and so on. These are all going to be used here. At the end, we'll come up with a very nice, beautiful result, and for which you can write a sum. 
Okay, so so the what we have here, we have a 3D world like this one. We want to take a picture. We take two pictures. There's a one picture from left camera, and this is the image plane of the camera. This is the camera center, and we take another picture right camera, and this image plane of right uh, image plane of right camera. So then uh, what we do that if I have a point P here then this image is going to be formed in this left camera here, which will be XL. And um, the image of this point in the right camera will be formed here, which is called XR. And these are the center of camera, CL and CR, left camera, right camera. And uh, one thing you notice that all the points which lie on this line will have one image, which is this one, because it's a ray of light hitting. So all these points will project in one point. Now, on the right camera, all these points will be projected differently, you know, each point here, another point here, and so on. Okay? So now, this line, which is actually projection of a one point in the left camera, is called epipolar line. Okay? That has a name, it's called epipolar line. Because in one camera, it's a line, in another camera, it is a point, and that's the geometry the way it is. So that's one thing which you need to know. Second thing is that the image of the camera center, which is here, say right camera, in, in the left camera is called EL, which is called epipole. Okay? And the image of the um, <clears throat> left camera in the right camera, which is ER, and this is epipole. So it has a name. So what we are doing, that we are finding the image of the camera center by connecting the camera center with the camera center of other camera. So that, that's a way. Always when we find an image, we take a point and draw a line from that point to the center of camera, which is here. Then, then wherever it hits the image plane, that's the image. Similarly, as we did, we draw a line from the point the center of right camera, it hits here, then that's the image. We take this point, right, a uh, line from here to this one, it's an image, and so on. So, so we have epipole, and we have epipolar line, okay? And then this is called epipolar plane. So we have a point P, CL, and CR, and um, we have um, <coughs> these three points, they make a epipolar plane, and this vector, which separate from the separate the two cameras, CL and CR, is called translation vector, T vector. Okay, so that's very simple, very intuitive. We have two cameras, and we are looking at how we are taking two pictures. That's first thing. Now we are going to look at a little more detail, and we are going to look at these vectors. So vector from CL to that point P, we'll call PL, left vector. The vector from CR to P we'll call right vector, and this vector we already talked about translation vector. Okay, so now you see that these vectors lie in the plane. Okay, the vector T, vector PR, and vector PL minus T, uh, which is this vector. These three vectors lie in the plane, as you see. Now, when the vectors lie in the plane then we have the coplanarity constraint, which means you can take any two vectors, find the cross product, and then find a the dark product of a third vector that has to be zero, that you must have learned somewhere. So that is what this is saying. I take two vectors, T and P, L, find the cross product, and find a dark product with the third vector, it has to be zero, because they are on the, all, all on the plane. Because you take two, two vectors, find the cross product, the third vector, the, the cross product vector has to be perpendicular to that plane, yes? And if you find the dot product of vector which is perpendicular plane and the vector which is parallel to the plane, it has to be zero because 90 degrees, zero, okay? So that's what this is saying. So now also we can see that the PR uh, vector, which is um, this vector, we can write down in terms of the PL, which is this vector, and the translation and rotation. This is, a, this is the relating the two coordinate system of this left camera, right camera. We take a PL minus T and rotate, and we get PR, which is shown here. It's a pretty simple transformation. So that's one thing. Now we can further manipulate this 
and uh, we can, um, for example, take the rotation matrix and um, bring it on the other side, uh, which would be inverse or trans rot transpose of this rotation matrix. So this will become transpose. We have PR here and PL minus T. Okay? Then we can take a transpose on both sides. So this will become PR transpose and then R and this whole thing will become PL minus T transpose, okay? It's a pretty simple manipulation of these vectors, the transpose, and so on. So, yes? Why would you take the off to the next side and hmm? the Yeah, so see that what the idea is that um, <clears throat> the, if we um, take, the, take this, uh, this matrix um, here, so we started from here, okay? So the, we have to take on the other side, we'll have the R inverse, okay? So the, as you see, the rotation, inverse of rotation matrix is transpose of the rotation matrix, as we have talked about. If you rotate clockwise and if you rotate uh, counterclockwise, they are inverse. So therefore, this is, this is true, okay? So the other thing is that now we are taking a transpose. If you have two matrices A, B, transpose of that, will become B transpose A transpose. That's what it is. Okay? So now, given this thing, we are going to put in in this, this our original um, constraint here, that PR is um, uh, given by this and this relationship. So from here, we found out that PL minus T is given by this. So PI, PR transpose, and then rotation matrix R. So instead of um, this one, we will replace by this. So we have now that PR R transpose and then T cross product PL. So this is fine, we just keep it here. So we have done all this manipulation for this vector and we found out that this we can replace by that. So we have now these matrices, yeah. So the rotation matrix is actually transforming First camera to the second camera? Yeah, with respect to second, yeah, that's right. So, so because you, you can relate any two coordinate system by rotation translation, that's what this is saying. So now we have this, okay? Now again, PL is the vector, which is from here to here. T is this vector, R is the rotation matrix, PR is this vector. We know meaning of everyone. So in an equation, you, it's important, you need to know what each thing represents, then you can, you know, uh, you know, visualize and you can really have meaning. If you don't know they are just symbols, then it's very hard. You have to memorize and it doesn't make sense. Okay, so we have this one. Now um, what we are going to do is um, we will introduce this idea of these cross products. So remember that we have two vectors, T and PL, is a cross product of that. As we say, we can write down as a matrix multiplication. So we will find the matrix S, which will be from the T vector, and multiply with the PL vector, so which is this one. This is the matrix, anti-symmetric matrix. The zeros are diagonal, and then TX, TY, and they are negative of each other. That's good. So then there are two matrices, R matrix, which is the rotation matrix, S matrix, which is the translation vector, anti-symmetric matrix. We multiply these two matrices, is called E matrix and is called essential matrix. And that is what was discovered by Lange and Hedgen in 1980. And it was the first paper in Nature. You know, Nature is a very famous journal for science and published that, that you can do that. It's very, because what it's doing, it's capturing this transformation between two, you know, cameras in the 3D um, by a very simple equation, which is saying, that take the P A R transpose that, which means the coordinates of the point P in the R right camera coordinate system, coordinates of the same point in the left camera system, multiply with the essential matrix, which contain rotation and translation between these two cameras, it has to be zero. It's a very nice result, very compact, and that that's why it became famous called essential matrix. So, so far, we haven't taken the images, it's in 3D. PL, PR, they are all 3D. So the next thing we are going to do will be in, in the image plane 
and that's why it's called fundamental matrix. This is called essential matrix, the next one is called fundamental matrix. And that is, again, very simple. Now, when we apply camera model, and we did this last lecture, that we take a point in the world, say left camera, multiply by camera matrix, we get this image, which is shown here. And um, we take the right um, camera matrix and multiply by the coordinates in 3D, right camera, we get the uh, one, this one is the left, this one is the right camera, okay? And then we have this relationship of these, the essential matrix and these 3D coordinates like that. So we are essentially going to use these camera models to find the PL from here. We just find the inverse of M, which is shown here. PR from here, find the inverse of MR, like here. And um, so then we are going to um, take the PR and find the transpose of that. Again, we have two uh, vector and the matrix. So the transpose will be this transpose and then this transpose. So we'll have this. So now we have PR transpose in terms of this and PL in terms of this. We are going to substitute here. Okay? So for PR transpose, we'll substitute this and PL will substitute this and that will become like this. This is the uh, PR transpose, this E here, and PL from here. And then we have the essential matrix E, left camera matrix, right camera matrix. We have three matrices multiplied together, become one matrix, and that is called fundamental matrix. Bingo. You know? That's, again, a very interesting result. So what this is saying, that I take a point in left camera, multiply with fundamental matrix, then find a, you know, the corresponding point in the right camera, multiply with it, it has to be zero. That's called fundamental matrix constraint. And we just drive it, it's a very simple geometry. Okay? And it has a lot of big consequences because it is really, you know, have big impact in the, in the field. So, so that's it. You know? So now the fundamental matrix is a three by three matrix, which has these nine elements, and um, it is X, the image in the right, the X transpose image in the left, and it has to be zero. So now, as you saw in the picture, that if I have a point in the left, it will be projected the line in the right, and um, so therefore, if I take a point, multiply with fundamental matrix, this is actually a line, and multiply that with the X transpose, then it, become, it has to be zero. So that is what the fundamental matrix is. So now, this is, has properties, it has nine elements, and um, it is of rank two, because the, the S matrix is of rank two. That matrix we, we, we caught, that anti-symmetric matrix, as you remember here uh, from the translation, it is rank two. Rank of this is two. If you find the eigenvalues of this, and actually you should do that, uh, then one of the eigenvalues will be zero. So if not all three eigenvalues are non-zero, the rank cannot be three. If one of the eigenvalues is zero, so rank can be maximum two. So this actually has rank two. So, so that's one thing we are going to use that actually. So um, then other thing to look at is that this fundamental matrix is capturing um, the tr rotation translation between th 3D in the coordinate system and also some internal parameters of the cameras. So if you add all those together, there are, on, there are actually seven degrees of freedom. Okay, well, seven you know, variables there which you can change, but it's actually nine elements, the way it is. And uh, so, as I told you, this is a history started with Lange and Hedgen um, in 1981 in the paper in Nature Journal about the essential matrix. Hartley and Fogras came up with uh, simultaneously, one I think in CVPR, other one ECCV conference uh, in 1992, fundamental matrix idea, and Zhang, Zheng Zhu Zhang has come up with the robust way to estimate that. So we have talked about how to drive fundamental matrix. Now we're going to talk about 
how to actually estimate given two images. Okay, so again the fundamental matrix captured the relationship between two images and there's no approximation now. Okay, so all other transformations, you know, we talk about affine, projective, and all these, they're approximate. Now, projective is approximation when the scene is planar and the perspective projection. Affine is uh, um, approximation when the, um, the orthographic projection. But here, this relationship, fundamental metric, there's no, no, no approximation. It's, a, it's full. It is perspective, it is full 3D and all this thing. So that's you want to note. So now, the, using this uh, fundamental matrix relationship, we have this, that we have a vector in, say, left camera, the corresponding point in the right camera, and then we have these nine unknowns. So our aim is to find these nine unknowns given two images. Say, so when Harris points here, Harris points here, find the correspondences, and then estimate these nine unknowns. And that will do a lot for us. So how do we do it? Um, so we can, you know, uh, multiply this with the matrix. So this becomes xi prime f11, yi prime f12, and f13, which is shown here. Multiply with second row, we'll get this. Multiply with third row, we'll get this. Then we multiply this with that, and then we'll get one equation. So this x prime will multiply with this, all these elements, y i will be multiplied with this, and so on, we get one equation. So which means if I have one point in the left and we have point corresponding to the right, so the left camera is x i y i, the image point, and the right camera is x i prime y i prime, then I can get one equation. And I have nine unknowns. Okay, so I need more points. So that is what we have. And so this is the equation in which we have F1 to F9, or, or F11, F12, F13, and F33. There are nine, nine elements. And these image coordinates in left and image coordinates in right, X and Y and X prime, Y prime. So, so one equation for one point. And so we are going to do, again, like a least square fit, you know, like we have the one point, one equation, so it will give you this row, second point, the second row, third row, and we have n points, n rows, and f is the nine unknowns here, and this has to be zero. So that's, again, a homogeneous system. So this cannot have a unique solution. Okay, so therefore we can pick one of them arbitrarily, so we actually have to find eight unknowns. Okay, so that's what we are going to do. So the computation of fundamental metrics, there is this um, algorithm from Hartley. It's called eight-point algorithm. As we said, there are nine unknowns, but it's a homogeneous system. We can find only eight. The ninth element, we will select arbitrarily one. Okay, which is fine. So therefore, his algorithm needs eight points, correspondences, and two images, and go through and estimate the fundamental matrix. And listen to this very carefully. Um, these steps are important, but at the end, it's, it's very nice. So um, the objective is, and this is a very famous paper, you know, uh, it is called in defense of eight point algorithms title is that that uh, you know in PEMI. so we want to compute fundamental metrics such that you know this is certified that's our you know constraint so um, so what we are going to do so we are given eight points we are given the points you know eight points in first image second image we know their correspondences they know coordinates in left image coordinates in right image so first thing we are going to do is normalize the coordinates and by applying some scaling and translation so that we can have both in the same kind of uh, scaling format. So we will apply this, the transformation matrix translation and kind of um, scaling for the left and right. And that essentially means that these are the scaling and these are the translations. And that means that we'll take the points, 
in the left image, find the centroid and subtract the centroid from all other points and normalize these between 0 and 1. We'll do the same thing in the right camera. Find the centroid of eight points, subtract that, that centroid from all the points, and normalize the coordinates between 0 and 1. That's it. So then we will come up with a solution of that system I showed you by finding the eigenweight vectors of that A matrix. And he somehow showed in that paper that if you take the eigenvector corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue, that is the solution of this F vector, which is the fundamental matrix. You know, corner detector, Harris corner, Harris corner, you get lots of points. Then you find the correspondences. And um, once you know correspondences, then you do this. So we are assuming eight points are known, their correspondence is known, then we won't find the fundamental matrix. Okay? So, so with this, then you will find this F vector, but we are not done yet. Okay? So now, when you get the F vector, which is which is this vector here, which has the nine unknowns, then we are going to take that and make a matrix out of that because that's what it was, and um, then we will normalize it, and that's where we need to use this uh, norm. Okay? And um, so. This is a norm, which means we'll find the norm and divide each element in this matrix by norm. And we can use L infinity norm, L1 norm, and so on. So um, now is the important thing. Remember that we had a constraint that the S matrix is the rank 2. So we want to make sure that this, and if the matrix, fundamental matrix is product of S matrix, R matrix, and camera matrices. So if the one of the matrix, S matrix, is rank 2, the rank of the fundamental matrix cannot be more than 2. That's, that's another fact. So therefore, rank of fundamental matrix is 2. Okay? So what we are going to do, that we'll take the fundamental matrix and find the factorization of that in three matrices. U, the singular values, and V. And... Uh, these are the singular values. If the rank of this fundamental index is 2, the third singular value has to be 0. And if it is not 0, we'll force it to be 0 to satisfy the fundamental matrix. Because as you, as you know, the, we cannot find a unique solution from homogeneous system because it's A, F is equal to 0. There's no unique solution. So we found a solution here, and we want to force it to be rank 2. So we will make the third eigenvalue, a uh, third singular value, to be 0. Then we'll multiply back u and this, and we'll get f, which is better than the f we have here. So that is a very important step. So um, then last step will be we'll denormalize. Because remember, we normalize coordinates. We apply the t matrix to the left and t prime to the right and we'll come back and apply those as we did before here. And then that's it, we get a fundamental matrix. Now, this is the basic eight-point algorithm which was proposed and, you know, um, which uh, is a you know, very good contribution. Now, after that, uh, people found out that it's not enough. You cannot get a good fundamental matrix estimation just using that. So then there's an extension, there's a robust estimation of fundamental matrix by Zeng Yu Zeng, and which you use on the top of this, then you get really good fundamental matrix. Okay? So again, the idea here is very simple, and it's very intuitive. So let's say, as you were asking, you know, you can have lots of points, and left image, lots of points, right image. How do you select which eight points to use? Okay? So this is where the range sec will come. Okay, so suppose this is the these are the points. So what um, Zeng Yu Zeng does, they so take an image, divide in the eight by eight grid like this, okay, and then randomly select eight grid cells and pick one point from each of the cell. Okay, so you get eight points. You apply the Hartley's algorithm, right? You know the previous one on those eight points. Okay. So, and then you estimate fundamental matrix using that. Then, um, 
you select randomly select other eight cells and get the one point from each cell, apply the eight point algorithm for, by Hartley, and compute the fundamental matrix. And you keep doing that. That's what the RANSEC is doing. Now, then you find out, given the fundamental matrix, you find out how good it is by finding the error from the other points which were not used, because there are lots of points which only use eight points, as we are doing in fitting a line. We've, in fitting a line, we just selected two points, but there are lots of points. You find how much the error from the rest of the points that tells you how good is a fit. Same way here, we have lots of points, so we selected only eight, we find a solution, then we are going to look at the error of the rest of the points, which is the error from the left and from the right. We sum it up and find the error. And so we'll have error for fundamental matrix one, two, three, four, lots of errors. And we will find the median of that. And we'll pick the one which is, you know, is that uh, <clears throat> um, select the best F according to that residual. Okay, which has the least residual, which is the median error of these, all the points, remaining points which we are using. And that will give you the candidate fundamental matrix. And now we want to also look at that what if that error uh, determine, if the error is very large, then that will have lots of outliers. So we don't want to use that. We'll remove that. And the, the, at the end of it, we'll select, using this criteria, the one best fundamental matrix from lots of these, which has the basically least errors, as we did in filling an equation of line. Now, using this, um, this as, the, as the point, uh, as the fundamental matrix, then we will compute the uh, fundamental matrix with the weighted least square fit, where we will assign the weight which will portion of this weight, and using the, all the points. So that is basically the the algorithm by Zheng Yu Zheng, which is robust to outliers, and it try to use all the points, not necessarily only eight points, and the question is which eight points, that's why it's dividing eight by eight and selecting randomly, and it turns out this, met, this estimation is much better if you use only eight point algorithm, okay? So that is basically um, the fundamental matrix computation and also the derivation. So if you do that, then if you have these two images, now if you want to do say stereo between these two images, then you won't be able to do because these are very different viewpoints. You cannot take a line row here and go to exactly the same row and find the correspondences. So once the fundamental matrix is known, then you can rectify these images, and these are the epipolar lines. So therefore, the match of this line, this point will be on this line, exactly the same. Match of this line will be exactly the same, as you are showing here. And that is the advanced application of the fundamental matrix that can help you rectify images. And this is another example. See, there's a big rotation, but we can find the epipolar lines that, are, if I want to make this, this point, points around here, I'll just go correspond to epipolar line like this one. Okay, if I want to find the correspondent here, and I'll for like correspond there. So that is um, um, the example. There's another example here. Uh, again, these are the epipolar lines for these two images. These are epipolar lines for these images, and fundamental matrix help us to estimate that. In addition to all other application of that. Okay, so that's um, that's the fundamental matrix. So. Um, what this is doing is um, essentially um, that we want to normalize the xy coordinates between 0 and 1, or yeah, 0 and 1, and uh, we want to make the, the origin at 0. So which means 
you will take the set of points, you will find their mean and subtract the mean from each point and uh, that will normalize between 0 and 1 and then um, you will also scale no actually that will you know make the origin and then you scale them between 0 and 1 so this is that you essentially are changing the origin to dx dy which is the mean of these points and you are scaling in x and y with these amounts so you find the range of x and range of y so you divide the range by every point, so it will be you know, maximum, minimum, so it will, it will be scaled between 0 and 1. And similarly you do for the y, okay? And that will scale, if you have set up numbers, you want to scale between 0 and 1. You find a maximum, you divide the maximum of everybody, and you know, it will become 0 and 1. That's scaling. And you do scaling x, scaling y. Second thing you want to do, that you want to put, you want to make the mean of the points as the origin. So you want to subtract the mean from all the points, so they are with respect to that, and that is the the translation here. So this is just a, a formal way to do the normalization, but you can write a program to do it. Okay, yeah. Huh? Lines are useful. See, line is like a line a row in an image. So you have an image. Say you have 256 rows and 256 columns, a matrix number. Huh? So now you have a corner point in row number 50 and at column number 30. So you have corner point. You want to find the match of that point in the next image, right image. Now you can go search in every row where is the match for that, where it's exactly the same corner occur. There will be a lot of computation, there will be some ambiguity and so on. So the best way will be that if you go to right image, you go row number 50 as was the point is in the left image and find its match. Okay? So that's the idea of row. And row is a line. So as we were talking about here, that uh, <coughs> the um, the epipolar, you know, geometry here here. So see the now um, <coughs> the I have a point here. This is the image of this point. Now I want to find where is the match for this in the right image. So. I can go in the whole image, a lot of computation, and I may get confused and so on. But if I know that it has to lie on this line, that's a people are lying. So I just search here, and I find out actually this is that point. So that's the idea. Okay?